Now, for the next 20 weeks, we are here to assess, test, love, hate, and maybe lick, slightly massage the best and latest tech around. <laughs> First up, we are talking photography and the moving variety of photography, commonly known as filming, even though we haven't actually used film cameras for years. Good point, Miss Perry. Now, in recent years, the gap that used to exist, the huge chasm of difference between the kit used by the professionals and the kind of stuff that the likes of you and I could buy down the high street, that gap has narrowed to almost nothing. Yeah, so that is why we have sent Otis and Polly to Morocco. Our adventure began with an instruction to meet in the noisy, bustling madness of Morocco's most vibrant and intoxicating city, Marrakesh. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man. Peace out. Yeah. Polly. <laughs> OK, yeah, thanks. Polly and Otis, each of you must create a tourism video for Morocco using only consumer technology to film, edit and display your finished work. In two weeks' time, you have to present your work before the head of the Moroccan Tourist Board, who will judge your efforts and declare a winner. Oh, it's, this is serious stuff. Yeah. Hmm. This challenge would reveal just how close consumer tech can get to creating professional-looking videos. That meant a lot of research, so I kicked off by borrowing a projector and a few DVDs. Morocco's a favourite destination for Hollywood filmmakers, and watching their beautifully crafted images made me realise that to win this challenge, not only would I have to find the best consumer kit available, but also some very clever ways to use it. Meanwhile, I'd been looking at some typical tourism videos, but unlike Polly, the big vistas and endless sand dunes bored the pants off me. And don't even get me started on camels. The whole way these things are shot, edited, needs reinvention. Just don't know how yet. Maybe Otis just didn't know where to look. Sites like Vimeo showcase the work of future blockbuster movie makers, who often use the sort of affordable tech I'd have to. So perhaps I'd stumble across something that was not only interesting, but achievable. That is amazing. And after a while, I did. It's called High Dynamic Range HDR Time Lapse, and it's absolutely incredible. The process involves taking hundreds of high quality stills, which are shot over a couple of hours, then stitched together to create a moving image, looking like something that could only be shot on a Hollywood mega budget. Could you imagine that with a beautiful Moroccan backdrop? It'll be absolutely stunning. And eventually, I also hit pay dirt, coming across the work of Addictive TV. Wow. <laughs> they are VJs, or video jockeys, who cut up and mix images with distinctive sounds to build up a musical track, like this football trailer, where bouncing balls and kicks turn into thumping beats. So you're seeing and hearing the track. It's an audio-visual extravaganza. But Addictive do much more than produce alternative-style trailers for TV and movies. They also travel the world giving live VJ performances, like sort of audio-visual DJs. Suddenly, I no longer cared what Polly had planned because not only was I going to film the world's first VJ tourism video, but perform it live as well. My sensory overload slash tourism video slash performance is going to blow her out of the water. While Otis enjoyed a slash, I was already at my first location. We both had just two days to complete our filming, and my Hollywood-style video meant visiting two other far-flung destinations in Morocco. So the clock was ticking. I was going to start with a Canon 5D, because not only will a good DSLR like this shoot in full 1080p HD video, but you can add on all manner of rigs and lenses to it, like this Lens Baby Muse. This really clever attachment lets you pinpoint exactly what you want to focus on within a larger scene. So if you take a look down there, there's a group of snake charmers. Now, I want the audience to see that they are part of a much bigger marketplace, but I want their eyes to be drawn to that exact spot. It's a technique called tilt shift. Tilting the lens away from the camera body makes the light hit the camera's sensor at an angle, distorting the image around the edge of the subject it's being aimed at and creating this unusual toy town effect. By now, I was also ready to start filming. Unlike Polly, though, I could capture all the material I needed right here in Marrakesh. But that didn't make my task any easier. 
So, for the video to work as an all-in-one audio-visual experience, the picture you're seeing has to identify the sound you're hearing exactly. I've got to get up close and personal. And I'd worked out I'd need around 70 different clips to create my VJ mashup. So, to have any chance of reaching my target, my tech had to be lightweight and portable. A smartphone seemed the answer, and there are many out there that shoot great HD video. But in the end, I chose an iPhone 4. The reason I want to go for this one is because of the increasing range of bolt-on peripherals that are available. For instance, this Albubo mount. The mount allows you to fit this N-Cinema 35mm lens adapter to it, which means you can attach any DSLR lens you want, in this case, a Nikon 50mm. Another great thing about the OWL mount is it allows me to plug in this Sennheiser mic. Because for my video to work, good quality sound will be just as important as the pictures. Yeah? Light iPhone action. I hit the central square and started to capture some shots, even if the action I was trying to film sometimes got a bit too close to me. Thank you. OK. I actually got a decent framing in there. The sound is brilliant. And I did all that with a snake round my neck. While Otis filmed on with his lightweight, portable microphone, mount, lens, iPhone construction kit, I'd hit the road for a four-hour drive to my next destination. Wazzers it. But no sightseeing trip for me, because although I was making some progress, I underestimated how long my filming process would actually take. I'm nowhere near getting enough clips, nowhere near getting the amount of clips that I want. To get the footage I needed, I'd have to carry on shooting well into the evening. And that's where this should come in handy. It's a rotor light. It should illuminate my subjects and keep them looking funky. As it got dark, I carried on filming, with just the occasional breather to join in with the locals. <laughs> However, as midnight approached, I decided to call it a day. So now you know there's pretty much nothing you can't slap onto Look, an iPhone. I think <laughs> this is its borderline ridiculous. Yep. And for that reason, I just love it. <laughs> I mean, I don't necessarily expect this to perform as well mm. as the, the Canon 5D Mark II mm -hmm. yeah. with this special Toy Town lens on it, because this is basically one of the world's leading digital SLR cameras. It is, and the quality is absolutely sensational, but the lens baby muse really gave it a great effect. Really interesting. Do you know what? So far, some really fantastic technology, and I honestly don't know where this challenge is going to go. Welcome back. Now I want to talk to you about bikes of the folding variety. They're a marvellous idea. Trouble is, they're a tricky gadget to get right. They've got to be easy and neat to fold on the one hand, but very pleasant to ride on the other. Well, to do some folding bike testing, I headed off to a very busy city. City streets don't get much more challenging than the streets of Rome. Here there's every type of urban riding environment imaginable, from traffic-strewn multi-lane highways to quiet cobbled back streets, which makes it perfect for a folding bike test. This Roman odyssey saw me travelling from a statue of Garibaldi on the outskirts to the Colosseum in the centre on three of the latest folding commuter bikes. The good-looking giant Halfway, the compact Django Flick V9, and the performance-focused Montague Fit. For the first leg of my trip across Rome, I'm going to use this, the giant Halfway. It's trying to be a sort of best-of-both-worlds intermediate-sized folding bike. Let's see. Oh, it's going to be a speed-up. First impressions are very good. Feels very rigid, doesn't feel like a folding bike. And uh, the 20 inch wheels are big enough so you don't feel like you're falling through the holes between the cobbles. The bike's eight gears are well spaced for town riding, and the mono strut alloy frame helps keep the weight down. The halfway was taking everything in its stride even seemed to be a hit with the locals. The only slightly disappointing thing was the caliper brakes. They were rather on the soft and squidgy side. But with a folding bike, how it rides is only part of it. Of course, the proof is in the folding. That's exactly what I'm going to do right now to catch a tram. Start with the uh, handlebars, rather nice and folding pedals. Uh, they go down there like that. Piece that. 
there. There we are, there's a bit of a fiddle with that. Um, Sorry, pardon. Oozing there. Right, well, I think we're there. Unfortunately, I missed the tram. There, never mind, wants to be another one long in a minute. Having missed the tram, I decided to ditch the halfway and the traffic and take a shortcut through Rome's back streets instead. Next up, the Django Flick V9. Our second commuter bike might be small in size, but it's big on tech. And to test it, I've come off the main street onto these really rather interesting cobbled streets, which uh, normally would be a bit of a problem for a bike with these very tiny wheels, but on the Django, it's not such a problem because it's got suspension front and rear, and it's doing a great job of evening out the bumps. However, there are downsides to this magic carpet ride. The suspension adds weight and makes the steering feel vague. What the Django isn't is very stable. It's always threatening to pop a wheelie. Your centre of gravity is way over the back wheels, and then you lose your steering. Ugh. Ugh. Powerful disc brakes, though. Of course, as ever, with a folding bike, riding is only half of the story, and you can fold the Django in two different ways. There's a sort of wheeling mode that you can use at airports or railway stations and that sort of thing, in which case you just fold the uh, saddle through the handlebars, you can wheel the bike round like that. Excellent. The second involves dropping the handlebars as well for a more storable package. Great for popping it into the back of a car or a taxi or a van like this. Good. Finally, with the light failing, I jumped aboard the fastest bike on test in an endeavour to get to the Colosseum before sunset. This is the Montague Fit. Most normal looking of the three bikes I'm trying today, but it's also the one you'll feel almost instantly at home on if you're used to riding a normal bike. With its full-sized frame and cycle parts, it's made for people who want the convenience of a folding bike but don't want to compromise on performance. It's really fast and light. I like the full-sized wheels with their minimal number of spokes. It's got 27 speeds, so it's really fast on the level and you can change down easily for going uphill. Its hill climbing ability is also no doubt aided by its weight. Despite it being the biggest bike on test, at just over 11 kilos, it's easily the lightest. This is a folding bike you really could use for a long distance commute. Of course, the price you pay for having a full sized bike is that when you have to fold it to get to your destination, you end up with a larger bike to carry. It's not that easy to fold either. The most difficult bit is taking off the front wheel. You've got to sort of get the handlebars under your uh, armpit. It's almost a two-person job, really. But folding the frame is a doddle using the Montague's patented single catch system. There's nothing to hold it back like that. You've just got to carry it like that in one hand with the wheel in the other. Right, off to the Colosseum. So, perhaps not great for the train or bus, but OK for putting in the boot of a car or lugging down a short flight of steps. Now for the G ratings. And it's four Gs for the giant halfway. It's been built to offer the best of both worlds, and it definitely delivers. Two Gs for the Django V9. Certainly fun over the cobbles, but vague steering and excess weight let it down. And it's four Gs for the Montague Fit. Big bike performance with the added flexibility of a folding bike. Perfect, as long as you don't have to fold and unfold it too often. Right, time now for a top five to put a big smile on your face. I'm talking toothbrushes of the powered variety. Now, contrary to what my mum says, they're not just for people that can't be bothered to go like this. If you use the right toothbrush and you use it properly, then you can get your gnashes pearly white. But which are the right models? Well, here is our top five. I'd lined up 20 of the most popular powered toothbrushes on the market and met Scott Deacon from the Cochrane Collaboration, an organisation that's carried out the UK's leading research into the benefits of powered brushing. Hi, Scott. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you for doing That's this right, for no us. We've got loads of gadgety toothbrushes here, which all seem to vary quite a lot. Let's put them under our camera Great. and have a look. Using the Olympus iSpeed 3, we film the brushes in super slow motion to clearly show the differences in their brushing action. Wow, look at that! 
What's it actually doing? Well, this is a rotation oscillation type brush. It goes backwards and forwards around a circular pattern. Well, this is a sonic toothbrush at very high frequency. It moves backwards and forwards a very, very small amount, which then helps to clean the teeth a little bit more effectively. Equipped with my newfound knowledge, we looked at the features of the brushes, getting rid of those that just didn't scrub up. Right, so the Orbital B Triumph, mm -hmm. it's got this little smart guide, which is Bluetooth. So if you press on the br brush there, mm -hmm. you can see that the little warning light comes up on it, and that's to try and protect your gums when you're brushing, because actually the most important bit to brush is where the tooth and gum meet. That's a dumbbell. <laughs> that's not making it through. Now, this Philips Sonicare Diamond Clean, I think, is really sexy. The ceramic finish, mm -hmm. it's got induction charging, and... Look, you can charge via USB. Colgate Actiflex. Mm. What's interesting about it, it's got a cheek cleaner. It's very clean. Clean cheeks, <laughs> it's the way to go. There are no features, it's very basic. That's out. We'd narrowed it down to our favourite ten and lined up a very messy test to see which brushes could get into those hard-to-reach nooks and crannies. And for this, we need a Jason look-alike dummy and a pot of strawberry jam. Is that a bit easier to get in That's there? That's really easy, yeah. 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 Or will be 5,000 thumbs up. Thumbs Let's up, that definitely. Through. That's not going to clean your teeth so well as a smaller head. Okay. More jam, I think. All right, I'll get yeah. more jam. It's so white and it's so beautiful, it's going to get covered in jam. Ah, <laughs> oh, look. Soiled, but through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, after a few hours of dental dissection, we had our top five. Our final test was to look at plaque removal. We'd invited five guests who hadn't brushed their teeth for 12 hours and added disclosing solution to their teeth to show the plaque levels. And then if you bite your teeth together for us, that's it, so good. And just chin down a little bit. There you go. <laughs> We took photos of their plaque levels before brushing. Smile! <laughs> Look at those, they are yeah. disgusting! <laughs> Let them brush for two minutes. OK. Oh, wow. Stop. Then took another round of photos <laughs> to make a before and after comparison to rank our top five. At five, it's the Omron Sonic Style 458, a great looking toothbrush which removes plaque effectively, and we like the ability to change the depth of its oscillations to suit various parts of the mouth. At four, it's the Philips Sonic Hair Flex Care Plus, a brush that did well in all of our tests and comes with a UV sanitizer to remove bacteria from the user's brush heads. At three, it's Oral-B 2000, a great all-round brush whose rotation oscillation head was perfect for removing plaque and cleaning those hard-to-reach places. At two, it's the stunning Philips Sonicare Diamond Clean 300 series, the best-looking brush we tested with great all-round features, and it was only put to the post due to its hefty price tag. It's the Oral-B Professional Care Triumph 5000. This brush removed the most plaque during our tests and the handy wireless smart guide is a useful addition to promote healthy brushing. Oh. Susie, it's brilliant. I was so impressed with your thorough testing. I mean, those videos. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, those pictures, those close-ups of the bristles actually oscillating and moving. They were really instructive, actually. Right? They, really, yeah. they really did communicate, actually, mm -hmm. what it is the designers of the different types of toothbrush yes. you were testing were trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, so this is the winner. They're all be trying at 5,000. And, of course, you have to clean your teeth for at least two minutes, and it also is down to technique of using these. Yeah, it's always down to technique, Suze. Behave. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome back. Now it's time we talked games. The last 12 months have been fantastic for gamers. We've seen the arrival of Connect and Move and the advent of En Masse 3D. It's been an amazing year. So you'd think that the tech heads and geeky types of the gaming industry would want to just put the feet up, you know? Chill out. Take a gap year. Nah. There they were a few weeks ago at E3 in LA, the world's biggest gaming exhibition with yet more fantastic gaming hardware and software. And yours truly, just like the last few years, had my bags packed and my ticket to fly there and bring you a Gadget Show E3 report. Then I got food poisoning. It was nasty. But don't worry, because our intrepid Gadget Show team went there on my behalf. And so, here it is, this year's E3. <laughs> At this year's Goliath Gaming Expo, E3, held in Los Angeles, there were hundreds of amazing new titles and brand new industry-changing hardware on show. And as soon as I was out of my sick bed, I headed straight to an event in London to try out a handful of the games that I'd missed out on in the States. 
and first to show off its wares was Microsoft with this, Connect Star Wars. Connect has taken the world by storm and is in fact the fastest selling piece of consumer technology ever with over 10 million units sold. And so it's important that Microsoft keep their consumer base happy and they're doing it with a whole raft of new Connect titles including sequels to last year's hugely popular Dance Central and Connect Sports and some old favourites updated to be Connect controllable such as Tom Clancy's Future Soldier oh, yeah. and Mass Effect 3 but I reckon the one to watch is this Connect Star Wars in my Jedi hand nice but it's not just Connect that will be having the lion's share of the highly anticipated new games this year, as E3 also hosted some of the biggest games across all the platforms. And this year, it was all about the threes. Uncharted 3, Super Mario 3DS, and Battlefield 3. But this year could be special for another reason. We're going to have new consoles to play our games on. And Sony was the first to throw their hat into the ring. This is Sony's PS Vita, and it's their successor to the PSP. It's going up in direct competition against Nintendo's 3DS, and it doesn't sport three-dimensional graphics. But what it does do is graphics in a handheld device the like of which you have never seen. It has two analog control sticks, a five inch capacitive OLED touchscreen, a touch surface on the back, quad core graphics, and a motion control gyroscope to create similar experiences to what we've come to know and love on the iPhone. That is brilliant. But the biggest story at E3 was Nintendo. They've led the market for years with this, the Wii, but when they dropped the Wii U, it caused something of a storm. The Wii U is Nintendo's first high-definition graphics console, but the really unique selling point is their new controller, which is more like a tablet than a joypad. And the tablet is designed to allow you to interact with the game in the room around you, not just on the TV. It even allows you to keep playing the game when the TV switched off. It will also let you play all your old Wii titles and will be compatible with Wii controllers and the balance board. And with Wii U dedicated Tekken and Tom Clancy games, we're looking at a whole new era of gaming fun. The only annoying thing is that we've got to wait until 2012 to get our hands on it. Last year was really exciting, but this year they've managed they've managed to do it again and raise the bar even higher. In 12 months, it's How? extraordinary. I don't know. I mean, you know, so much extraordinary stuff out there. Lots and lots of software that put, is now pushing the hardware from last year yes. where it needs to go, like the Kinect stuff, like the Star Wars stuff, and the <laughs> Vita. There it is, the new handheld console from Sony PlayStation. And I've got to say, the graphic quality is something akin to a third generation console. Yeah, move across. Y yeah, here. this is a touch screen at the back, and you can actually ah. move. It's really <laughs> nice. Yeah. Right, you might remember that earlier in the programme, these two fine specimens were tasked with using consumer technology to try and showcase an entire country. Yeah, we were sent on assignment to Morocco and there, using the best consumer tech we could get our hands on, we were to make a tourist information video. And the final videos will get judged by the Moroccan tourist board and the winning one will actually be put on their website. No pressure there then. We'd already got a day's filming under our belts. I was staying put in Marrakesh trying to capture the 70 short clips I needed, but I was still well short of my target. My video required three very different looking backdrops, so I'd now travelled on to my second destination. But while Otis was still in bed hugging his pillow, I had to be up at dawn. And the reason I'm up so early is so I can see the sun light up this ancient Casbah in all its brilliant HDR time-lapse magnificence. My HDR time-lapse sequence involved linking a large number of stills together to create a movie-like effect. To give the sequence a bit more movement, I'd fixed my Canon 5D to this stage zero dolly system which consists of a 1.7 meter rail and MX2 dolly engine that instructs the camera when to move up the rail and by how much. I've worked out that I need to actually leave it stationary for about 10 seconds so that it can take a burst of photos. It will then move along the dolly about three mil and then take the next burst of photos. And the reason the camera's taking a burst of shots at each position and not a single one is because I've also set up a function called auto bracketing 
The problem is I've no idea how much the light is going to change over the 90-minute time-lapse period, so programming in the correct exposure levels is largely guesswork. However, auto bracketing solves that issue because it instructs the camera to take three quick-fire shots at different exposure levels. By merging them later, I'd be sure that every single image is perfectly exposed. I hoped it would look spectacular, but couldn't check if my calculations had been right because I now had a three-hour journey to my last destination and a further two hours back to Marrakesh. So, I was really up against it. While Polly was on the road again, I was now up and in amongst the Marrakesh souks trying to tick a few more shots off my massive list. But just when I needed things to go well, they didn't. Ah! Oh, I wasn't recording it! Such a klutz. Right, free macaroon for someone. And apart from my own mistakes, there were other issues. OK, now the problem with this challenge is capturing the sounds as and when it's made. So if I hear something go off in the distance, I can run over, frame up, wait for something or someone to make that noise, and it doesn't happen again. So timing is of the essence. I mean, listen to this. This is how quiet that is. How am I meant to make music with that? My music was the sound of water as I'd reached my last filming location, the Azud Waterfalls. The instant I saw images of this place, I knew I had to get up into the sky. But sticking to our consumer tech principle, I couldn't just go hiring a real-size filming helicopter. So instead, I've got this. Equipped with a Contour HD action cam, this electric-powered Gowie 330 XS quad flyer should provide a stable filming platform. But flying in the turbulent air of a waterfall is no job for an amateur. So I'd brought in local radio control expert, Mehdi. So I just wonder what's going through these people's minds right here. I bet they've never seen anything like this. It was all going brilliantly. Until the quad flyer suddenly lost radio reception and plunged out of sight down the rock face. I immediately assumed it had been destroyed. And with it, my precious film footage. It seemed my movie-making challenge was at an end. While Polly was looking into an abyss, my luck was changing. <laughs> I got it! And finally, I got across the finish line. I'd spent hours on the road over the last few days, travelling hundreds of miles, only to fall at the very last hurdle as my remote control helicopter crashed somewhere far below. It seemed Otis would win before we even returned to the UK for the formal judging. Until someone spotted something in the bushes below. A brave local retrieved the stricken machine with camera intact, and suddenly I was back in business. Oh, Great tech, guys. Oh but of course, the quadricopter was almost a, a disaster for you to go all that way. Well, well, it was, and to see it just drop, and you'd all of a sudden you just think, that's everything we've just filmed, yeah, everything we've been working for, gone. But luckily enough, we rescued and it. And I can't wait to see the footage. So which one of these guys would have gone all the way to Africa for absolutely no reason at all, maybe just a, a kebab? Uh, and which one of them will have a future career in the tourist industry? Find out <laughs> after the break. Welcome back, and to a task that took Otis and I from the studio here in Birmingham to the majestic mountains, deserts and markets of Morocco. Yes, we'd been sent out there to make the very best video we could using consumer tech to show Morocco in all its majesty and splendour. And I'd gone down the route of Scott, Cameron, Spielberg to use the latest cutting-edge consumer tech, which would hopefully create a cinematic masterpiece. Whereas I'd gone down the route of Rooney G. Betamax and Zebla. What? VJs! Um, yeah, so I had all my clips together, and what I was going to do was perform a live Moroccan mashup in front of our judges. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. But before the presentation day, I still had a lot of editing to do and performing skills to learn, which meant swapping Morocco, Africa for Watford, Hertfordshire. Because along this unassuming suburban street lies the headquarters of Addictive TV, the guys who inspired me to take the VJing approach. Graham and Mark are the masterminds behind the operation. I started by asking them the most important question of all. OK, boys, I've sent you through some clips. Um, how did I do? No, they're great. They're really great. Some of them, especially like this one, are the guys shaking the coins, because yep. we can use that as like the hi-hat. But why it's a really good shot? 
is because you can really clearly see what he's doing. Yep. And so you instantly understand the hi-hat sound comes from a guy chucking change in his hand. That was a relief. Now Addictive's expertise could swing into action. Mark's the sound specialist and uses an audio software program called Sony Acid to combine the various audio clips to produce music. The basis of any club track, you want to get a groove. So that's the, that's the backbone of the that's track. That's the backbone is, is the groove. While Graham ensured that every sound you hear matches every picture you see. Then, only then, will you get that full visual music flavour. Back in Morocco, my editing was much easier as I did the hard work during the filming process. This Acer Iconia laptop has two large touch screens instead of a normal keyboard and screen. Loaded up with Adobe Premiere Pro editing software that gave me all the display space and functions I'd need. And because I wanted my pictures to tell the story, I decided to leave out any chat, so just added a couple of captions. And some music, courtesy of Audio Network, that do a whole range of non-commercial tracks for reasonable money. With my editing now finished, I really like that. That's good. I started learning the mixing technique for my live VJ performance. It's the same process DJs use in clubs, combining the sounds from two different decks. The only difference is I'd be mixing sound and vision using DVDs instead of CDs. Missed it. Missed it. Missed it. Missed it. <laughs> Do that in my presentation, and it's all over. Ah! A few days later, I was back from Morocco so that Otis and I could present our videos to the tourist board representatives. I was up first, and as I caught sight of trade marketing manager Mr. Alaoui, the tourist board chief Mr. Kazmi, and special guest Mr. Bahajoub, who is editor-in-chief of North and South magazine, I was suddenly very nervous. Juliana, could you please show us your work? Hi, gentlemen. I decided to capture Morocco in the most beautiful and creative way that I possibly could. So, I hope you enjoy my film. Whatever the judges thought, I was extremely proud of my efforts. The HDR time-lapse sequence had come out just as I planned, and the waterfall images taken from my helicopter were equally spectacular, even if a bit wobbly in places. My video was over, but it was impossible to tell how well I'd done. Time for Otis to take the stage. What did Polly know about nerves? All she had to do was press the play button. We'd done all we could. Now it was down to the judges, who promptly left the room for a confidential meeting. In French. After what seemed like ages, they returned. By now, our nerves were in shreds. Well, the two videos are very well made, and I must congratulate you. But I leave the, uh, the announcement of the winner to my colleague, Alec. Oh, okay. And the winner is... Oh, it's... Oh, shukran. 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 Shukran
Yes, oh. brilliant. Well, thank you. Well thank you done, both much. of you. But Otis, what a fabulous, refreshing way of seeing advertising. Thank I you think very much. that would make you remember Morocco, which is what it's all about. Yeah. Essentially, that diverse visual and oral experience came from your iPhone. That's yeah. remarkable. Mad, isn't it? So you are the first winner. Thank you. Yes, indeed, of the series. But that is out. all we've got time for on this show. But we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Excuse me.